So I'd like to welcome everybody to The Secret of Mind-Blowing Email. Uh, this is a webinar we hold semi-regularly to help educate anybody who's interested in email marketing, uh, whether they're doing it or they're thinking of doing it, on some of the best practices, uh, common challenges that email marketers face, and how you can get the most out of your email. So uh, I said at the very beginning, while we were waiting for more people to sign in, that if anybody has any questions, has any trouble seeing my screen or hearing the audio, uh, please let us know. Just post something in the chat box or, or ask a question. We are going to be asking questions throughout the webinar, so we, we'd love to hear your feedback. As we talk about challenges, we'll be asking you what some of your challenges are, uh, and we're going to open it up to a Q&A at the end. So uh, try to familiarize yourself where the uh, question box is, and um, we'll begin. So if anybody's uh, following us on Twitter or wants to talk about this on Twitter, please use the hashtag MindBlowingEmail. Uh, you can feel free to ask questions there after the webinar uh, or during the webinar. We'd be glad to answer them. My name is Michael Derwin. I'm the Director of Marketing here at Exclusive Concepts, and I'll be walking you through the presentation along with Tim G, who is our senior email marketing specialist. He's the man with all the answers, so he's the one to direct your questions to. So this is a brief agenda of the webinar that we'll be, we'll be presenting. Um, first, we'll go through an overview, which is just some, some uh, statistics on email marketing. Then we'll talk about <clears throat> some of the common, common challenges, <clears throat> which you can see here, um, time to plan and execute strategically, um, the fact that you may not have been sending email marketing out for a while or issues with your customers not liking or responding to your emails. And at this point, we'd like to hear what some of your challenges are so we can respond to them. Then we'll talk about some of the keys to success. We'll go through an FAQ, uh, some of the more common questions that we hear from people, and we'll discuss uh, best practices. We'll wrap up with a, a Q&A, so uh, line your questions up now or start adding them as we go through. Those we can't answer under common challenges, we'll get back to you during the Q&A. We'll try to, um, and we'll try to respond to them. Looks like we're having at least one person having uh, some technical issues. Uh, and then we'll do a quick wrap up. Uh, this is where we, we pitch you and tell you, uh, hire us to do your email marketing for you. But I promise it's one slide, it goes by quick, <clears throat> and it's for a very new product that we're, we're offering. And then we'll give you the contact and download information so you can download not only the recording of this webinar, but the slide deck and a brochure for our email marketing services if you can, um, if you're interested. Okay, we're still having a technical issue with the slides changing. So let me just pose a quick question. Uh, can everybody see a new slide now with the agenda? Okay, great. <clears throat> All right, so anybody wants to take a screenshot of this so they know when they um, they know what we're covering and maybe can refer back to it, feel free. Uh, feel free to take screenshots of any of this stuff. There's some good data in here. There's some good information, and we'll be providing some links at the end, which, while they're not interactive for you, um, you can go right to or you can wait for an email follow-up that we'll be sending you within the next couple days that will contain the same live links. So let's jump right into it. So some of the realities of email marketing uh, that we've discovered are pretty shocking. Uh, 1.9 billion e email users worldwide. It's a huge amount of people by anybody's standard, especially when you consider that each one of them receives almost 155 emails every single day. Certainly a lot of emails going out. And unfortunately, 88% of that email goes unopened. So, you know, we all know we receive email, we send email, we know people have issues with their, their trash box or uh, not getting back to them or, you know, them just going to the spam, through spam, getting caught in spam filters. And we're going to talk about how to fix that. But the important thing to know about email marketing is that 57% of email users check their email at least four times a day, which is, is pretty staggering. Considering the next number, that only 3% more check it at least daily. So 
it's a, a great channel uh, despite the growth of social media and SEO and PPC it's still a fantastic channel for marketing because it, it does get a lot um, a lot more attention than those channels especially when you consider it to Google searches 60% <clears throat> of users check email daily but uh, less than 30 check it uh, do a Google search daily so it's a takeaway from this with your email marketing you have to stand out and you have to be consistent um, both of which we will talk about later in the presentation so at this point I'm going to turn it over to Tim G who will walk you through the rest of the slide deck hi friends old and new um, it's great to have you guys here today um, so before I dive into some of the common challenges it's at this point where of our presentation where I feel like this is the critical point um, where uh, you kind of for have a little bit of a background as far as why email is important, um, but um, the reality is there's some challenges. And I think that uh, what I like to commonly joke as this is the Bowflex moment of the presentation where, um, you know, in a Bowflex infomercial, you see the guy with the crazy awesome abs and you say, hey, you know, this is achievable. But then when you get the both flex in the mail and you're even if you're amped up to use it, the reality is there are challenges and pain points. Um, so right now I wanted to kind of go take a couple slides and invest some time into talking about um, common challenges uh, for that befall um, both novice email marketers as well as email marketers who maybe um, have uh, deployed campaigns for a while now. So without further ado, the first common challenge is that um, a lot of email marketers um, out there, especially those who are um, sole entrepreneurs, a common quote is, I have no time to plan and execute strategically. So the, this is a scenario that might be familiar with a lot of you out there. And the scenario is this, you're an entrepreneur, um, you might have a small business, maybe a couple employees and a bustling online uh, website, uh, e-commerce stores thriving. So naturally you're very busy from nine to five. Um, and what ends up happening is around 1 AM, you're finally done with the day and you think to yourself, Oh, you know, I have to send out an email We're we're having a, a, a sale, a 50% sale off of widgets. And I want to be able to send that out to my most loyal customers. So there you are at 1 AM parked in front of a computer and you are typing away trying to develop an email campaign. Um, aside from the obvious that um, it's 1 a.m. and you probably should be in bed, um, there's a one very, very big problem with this scenario. And the problem is that there's a lack of strategic execution. As with any other marketing vehicle, you can choose to be able to kind of fly by the seat of your pants, and in which case you're losing out on valuable opportunity and you're also um, not leveraging the um, email or excuse me, the marketing channel to the fullest of your capabilities. And for all intents and purposes, this translates into money left on the table. So um, although you may be able to get emails out in this fashion, um, I would venture to say that uh, by doing this and kind of by doing this at the spur of the moment, you are um, not only potentially sending out the wrong messages and inconsistent messages from campaign to campaign, but you're also um, perhaps not necessarily thinking through exactly what you want to say, what you want to sell, and what you want to convey in terms of branding to your customers. So another common challenge is the last time we sent an email out was December 2011. So in that case, uh, it's February, as you know, and a lot may have changed from uh, the holiday season to now. And granted, this might not be as dramatic as if you were to send out uh, the last email send was December 2007, but at the same time, you kind of get my drift. Um, a, a, a month without sending an email is, an, is oftentimes a lifetime in email span. Um, as Michael has alluded to in the, uh, in the earlier slides, um, you are um, each email each email recipient is receiving on average 154 um, emails a day. So if you can imagine, the la if the last time you sent out was well over a, a month ago, chances are people's memories are going to be spotty, and not only that, but they're going to be replaced perhaps by a message that's sent out by your competitor. So. What I want to say to this challenge is that time is of the essence, but at the same time, there's no time like the present 
to be able to um, get back on the wagon and send out emails. And the third common challenge is oftentimes I hear this blanket statement, our customers don't like our emails. So my first reaction to that is, how do you know? Are you looking at the metrics in a constructive and kind of critical manner? Or are you just looking at focusing unhealthily on one particular parameter? Perhaps you're having a lackluster open rate from campaign to campaign, and that's a prevalent theme. But maybe your click-through rate is just, or conversion rate is through the roof. So in which case, it's not so much that your customers don't like your emails, but rather it's your customers don't like your subject lines, perhaps. So what I encourage you um, out there, you listeners out there to do is really, instead of um, getting frustrated with one particular metric, to be able to look at the um, email performance from a more holistic standpoint, where um, perhaps I venture to say it's more like a 50,000 foot view where you're looking at not only just the open rate or just the conversion rate, but looking at the suite of metrics and really, instead of saying it failed or was successful, to use it as an opportunity to learn exactly how your customers are interacting with your email. And in some cases, to be able to use the numbers to be able to justify what your customers' likes and dislikes are with the email program itself. So at this time, um, I think I'll take a break from uh, speaking. And if you have any challenges um, that, that, that you have, uh, have befallen your email program, please type them in the message box and I'll, I'll select one or two of them and uh, we can use these as discussion points. So a few people uh, posted a question a few minutes ago to see who's doing email marketing. We've got some good answers back. Some people are, are doing it in-house. Some people are working with an ESP, which is fantastic. Um, what are what are some of the challenges that that you folks are facing with uh, with you with doing it in house, not using ESP? Ah, okay. Somebody says I have no idea how to start one. Well, that's <clears throat> that's great. So, if you're working with an email service provider, they often will provide they'll often provide templates for you to use. So you can deal with some of the design and the development there and the messaging. If you are completely new to email marketing, that's probably the first step in the process is getting signed up with an email service provider. Exclusive Concepts is not an email service provider, although we work with most of the, the best in the business. And that's really your first step um, because trying to send email through Outlook or through Hotmail or Gmail to a massive audience is just not going to work. You're going to get stuck in spam filters. You're going to have design challenges and execution challenges. Next question: We have a low open rate. That's a great. That's a great question, and um, that's something that can be addressed relatively over time. But there's a basic uh, there's a basic tenant uh, with regards to that solution, and that solution often lies in um, two things. One is the subject line. And secondarily, it uh, lies a lot, uh, has something to do with the content as well. So in a nutshell, um, it may behoove uh, you, know, you in terms of uh, helping increase open rates to be able to test subject lines and really ascertain what is driving uh, people to open. So for example, uh, one simple test that you can do is split your list into 50% uh, lists, so subgroups of 50% each. And you can test the subject line where one subject line may have a value proposition. We're having a 50% sale on widgets today only. And the other subject line could be more informational. Uh, look at our brand new widgets. Um, and in which case, uh, you can take a look at how readers are opening, um, you know, whether which uh, subject line is more popular, an informational aspect or a value-based aspect. And based on that, you can make minor incremental changes. So for example, if the informational aspect is more popular, next time you might want to test the um, the uh, the effectiveness of including a brand. So, for example, um, instead of widgets, maybe um, in March you can have a subject line of "We have brand new widgets," and the next uh, the the B test to that could be "We have brand new widgets from Spacely, Spacely Sprockets," and in which case uh, you can test that and see exactly what um, your readers are interested in. 
Sure. I mean, using dramatic titles in the subject is a great way to get attention uh, as well. You know, there's some some tricks like using an ampersand instead of spelling out and works, right. uh, adding numbers. And what do we say? Brackets over parentheses? Uh, brackets over parentheses. Um, and I would say avoid quotes as well. And one thing that a lot of uh, ESPs, uh, Michael, that I may add is that um, a lot of people who are kind of uh, doing an email in-house, um, they don't look to test the, the uh, deliverability. So one, uh, one symptom of uh, a low open rate, excuse me, a one root cause of a low open rate is simply because it uh, could be that uh, your emails are ending up in the junk folder of your uh, customers. And in which case, if a customer can't see it, they can't really open it. Right, great. Um, one of the, I mean, I think a lot of these questions are are all related to open rates and everybody mm -hmm. struggles with those. I mean, you know, one of the things that people always ask is, you know, what should an average open rate be? Mm -hmm. And actually we ask that in this office as well, but there really isn't a good answer to that. It depends a lot on who your audience is, what your industry is, what you're right. selling. And then it also comes down to the subject lines. I mean, really the, the, the keys to, to good open rates are deliverability, which is which is very very important, and then subject lines. After all, the content of the email doesn't matter un, un, until they open it, right? Right. So you know, dramatic dramatic statements like you know, like the title of this webinar, for example, mind secrets of mind blowing email. Well, that's you've got to wonder what those secrets are and how much it will blow your mind. You know, things like that can go a long way, right. especially uh, when you've got holidays coming up, like Valentine's Day. You know, uh, make her fall in love with you all over again. What a great subject line. Right. How do I do that? Every guy wants to ask that. Right. Um, so, you know, think about your audience and, and put yourself in their shoes and think, you know, what would make you want to open it? Not like sign up for this free demo right. or, right. Um, you know, even even percentages off, you know, things like free shipping are becoming so standard, especially right. when you're competing with companies like Amazon that have same day delivery, which is insane. Um you know, those things don't resonate as much because everybody, everybody sees them. So, you know, one of the things I'd actually suggest is sign up for a lot of emails and see what other marketers are using and use something else, using something more dramatic, push the envelope. So um, if I may interject quickly, Michael, um, so uh, for those who are uh, being that there are a lot of questions about subject lines, I figured I'll uh, just uh, give uh, uh, you uh, listeners out there three quick tips um, that we use here, and uh, certainly uh, you uh, may find these useful. The first tip is keep your subject line brief, but long enough. And what I, the rule of thumb I usually have for this is keeping subject lines between 50 to 75 characters um, is extremely helpful because it tip, that length typically fits into the subject area allocated in most email platforms like Outlook or Gmail. So that's the first rule, um, 50 to 75 characters. The second um, suggestion that I have for you guys, um, and perhaps you guys can bake it in as a rule in your processes, is to test, test, test. Um, again, um, it's astounding to me how many prospects when they come uh, to meet for the initial meeting that they don't uh, really test um, emails for deliverability. And in which case, um, they don't necessarily know if their email campaigns are actually ending up in the inbox. And as Michael said, um, has, a, has a spoken to multiple times, um, you know, an email really is only as good as um, the moment it hits the inbox. Right. So we have a bunch of other questions about um, preventing your email going into spam and HTML versus plain text. We're going to save some of those for the Q&A near the end, and we will make sure to get to everybody's questions. So, so the, third, the third tip I have for oh, you yeah, guys, okay. <laughs> it's okay. Um, the third tip that I have um, is really to be able to assess whether or not your subject line is accurate to the content inside. And I, it is also, um, Michael, as you uh, have pointed out, it's helpful to look at other um, other uh, best of class emails. And it's still very surprising to me, the number of uh, email marketers out there who use a very catchy subject line. But when I open that email, the content has very little to do with the actual subject line. And in which case, um, you'll it's short term gain because you get a high open rate for one campaign, but you really burn a lot of the goodwill that um, subscribers may have and uh, have in your brand and in your company. I've actually unsubscribed from an email list because they had this great headline. It was a, um, you know, one of the, the new pop-up stores like Fab or, or Gilt or one of those. They constantly send me these emails and the subject line 
looks great. It's for, it's a very attractive offer to me. I click through and the product is nowhere to be seen. Mm -hmm. So Absolutely. it is really a big turnoff and trust is important in any yeah. market. I mean, not only that, but I've also received emails where um, the content has broken links, broken mm -hmm. images and things like that. And uh, I got to say, um, people's attention spans and their patiences are very short. So in all likelihood, typos may be okay, forgivable, but broken links and uh, broken images um, are much more grave. Right. So Tim, tell folks what some of your main keys to success are for email marketing. Sure, absolutely. I'd be happy to go into that, Michael. Um, so one key to success is a holistic strategy. Um, it's this, uh, what I mean by holistic strategy is, um, it's almost, it's almost a Zen, Michael, where, um, you have this awareness that email marketing, although it's a unique marketing channel, it plays within this larger ecosystem that may include other digital marketing efforts, such as SEO, pay-per-click, um, or even uh, some some of the more newfangled approaches like Google Shopping. Um, but but um, the idea really is to be able to figure out how email fits into your toolbox and what job this particular tool in the toolbox does. Is are you going to position email marketing as a revenue winner, as a branding enhancer and a brand ambassador to the marketplace, or something else entirely? And once you have an idea as far as what your what your over how email fits into your overall marketing strategy, you can begin to start to think about how email the strategy and approach to email marketing itself. And this permeates down to the very nitty gritty of execution, Michael, where we're talking about things like how often should I send? What kind of information am I putting in campaigns? Um, how strongly should my emails be branded to my, um, to my core uh, branding imagery and identity? Um, and by starting to think about strategy before you, um, before you implement, it's very much akin to the idea of being able to have ready, aim, fire, rather than fire, ready, aim. Um, a second key to success that's uh, absolutely critical and speaks to some of the challenges that a lot of email marketers have is maintaining momentum and consistency. Uh, now, Michael, um, I would ask you, you um, have you received email campaigns on a daily basis? And does that um, <clears throat> generate, a, a, especially if it's a brand that you like, does that help enhance some of the goodwill towards the brand? Um, it's not so much daily because depending who it's from, um, and I think most people here would agree that depending who it's from, it can either be annoying or mm -hmm. something I'd look forward to. Mm -hmm. um, there's a particular vendor that we looked at for a product who I received an email at least once a day for the last four years. Mm -hmm. So that makes me a really long tail lead. Sure. But when it came time to purchase, I didn't have to research vendors. Uh, I put them right at the top sure. of my list immediately. Absolutely. So, and one of the important things about the emails that they sent were that it was always valuable content. It wasn't sell, sell, sell. It was more, hey, this will help you out until you're ready to purchase from us. Now, this strategy doesn't work for everybody especially if you're selling, uh, you know, consumer products. Sure. Um, but certainly adding value in addition to your selling message is, is definitely uh, helpful. And it's definitely a strategy that, you know, that we take here. Absolutely. And in terms of momentum and consistency, uh, Michael, you pointed up a, out a very important um, key to this. And that is really to be able to be tactful about what momentum and consistency means. Um, so, Michael, that vendor that you mentioned, that example, you know, they emailed you every day. And perhaps, would you argue that perhaps getting an email once a week or every other week would be sufficient to keep it at top of mind? Sure. And I mean, more important to me was that they didn't just drop off the face of the earth. I exactly. Mean, yeah. I, I bought a car from a dealership seven years ago, and mm -hmm. I just got my first email from them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because they're, now they're doing email marketing. And you know what? They just missed me uh, from a recent car purchase by a couple of months. Mm -hmm. um, but after all that time, I mean, they took your advice. They hadn't been doing it, but then they said, you know what? We're just going right. to do it. And it worked. I didn't unregister. I saved it. And it refreshed in my memory why I liked my experience in shopping with them before mm -hmm. and continue to remind people about the brand. So, sure. yeah. you know, not disappearing out of my life is important. Right. And, and kind of knowing when to expect it to is helpful. Right. You know, the, um, the, the vendor that we use, 
I get their email uh, before I get into work. So I get up in the morning, I do what I need to do to get ready and get the family out of the house, and I check my email. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I look forward to seeing that there's that that right. email from them mm -hmm. there because it, it helps my day. So uh, kind of a how, that's great. And I think that part of um, the uh, this particular key to success in terms of momentum is really thinking about how the holistic strategy interplays with this. Um, certainly uh, the reality is you have the resources and, the, and, and to be quite blunt, the money to be able to send out a daily email where you're getting that return on investment and minimizing attrition. Um, so the key for this is really to be able to have a firm grasp and to be able to view email marketing as a lab where you're learning is a day is a daily email simply too much and overwhelming and suffocating your readers or um, is a weekly email send a much more applicable um, uh, uh, a cadence where um, you, you're able to uh, keep on top of mind but at the same time not annoy your uh, readers and your most valuable customers to the point where they're completely turned off to your brand. Right. So tell me about uh, driving customer response. Absolutely. Um, and this is a really important aspect because some email marketers, when they first start off, they think, well, the customers love my brand. They're in love with me and they know exactly what to do. Uh, and the rule of thumb here is that simply because an email is intuitive to you as an email marketer, and I'm referring to the layout and the design, doesn't necessarily mean that the layout and design is, is intuitive to your customers. Um, and what I say for this is really take a look at your, your existing uh, email campaigns. Look through the last four you sent out, for example, and take a look at it from a fresh pair of eyes where the rule of thumb here isn't necessarily when back in the public newspaper publishing days, people were, you have to write to what was it, Michael, a third grade reading level, mm -hmm. right? And, and in this case, um, I would venture to say that um, this needs to be intuitive in the email world to the equivalent of a third grade reading level um, where you have clear buttons, they're large, they're viewable, the discounts have, have, are clearly understood in the email, the product descriptions and the pricing is not hidden, so on and so forth. So that on the overall, there's a nice reader experience, not only aesthetically, but also from an ergonomic standpoint as well. Right. I mean, you know, similar to uh, a brick and mortar store, if you're trying to sell your products, you want them all facing out and on the shelf with yep. a big for sale sign. Right. You don't want them buried behind a rack or in the back row. Exactly. So be loud and proud. I'm always surprised, Michael, at the number of large retailers that send out emails with a great coupon code, something to the effect of 25%. I personally have my wallet open. I'm ready to buy. And you know what? I have to look through paragraphs or code to be able to get that uh, paragraphs of text to be able to get that coupon code and it's frustrating right right definitely so i'd like to ask you a few of the, the questions that we hear all the time i mean there's some some you know very basic ones that you know this is a, a new revision of this presentation deck we actually took out some of the uh some of the more obvious things but we realized that we you know we need to get them back in because they're um it's a, it, the recurring questions, you know, in the questions that we've gotten already, um, two, of, two of the three you're going to cover are going to pop up. Great. Yes. So uh, <laughs> time is uh, time is of the essence, as I've said. But again, there's there's a there's a right time and the wrong time. And a common question I get almost in every um, to almost every uh, individual that I speak with is what's the best time to send? And um it really depends. And uh, the reason I say that is because some customers, uh, your target customers may want to only read emails during business hours. Um, and it doesn't matter if you're selling a business to business products or recreational water skis. Uh, it just so happens some people um, like to browse emails during work. Uh, perhaps it's just the, the time that they have. And um, the reason, and so, uh, it really varies. And the best way to ascertain the ideal time to send is to be able to test. So the best way to test is to be able to pick two different days and times that you think will work the best. So it could be 6 p.m. on a Saturday versus Monday morning at 7 a.m. Eastern. Um, and by sending out campaigns, you know, perhaps the same campaign 
to 50% of your list on a Saturday and 50% of your list on a Monday and assessing the open rates, you can begin to triangulate. And perhaps the Monday um, campaign was uh, more successful. And in which case you want to test, hey, maybe it's a weekday and um, it's a weekday morning. So you want to test between 7 a.m., which is the reigning champ versus Monday, uh, excuse me, versus Wednesday at 9 a.m and uh, be able to kind of begin to triangulate through process of elimination in that fashion. Yeah, I mean, we've, you know, we found the same thing with our own uh, email marketing efforts, you know, to, to market this company. And, you know, it's not only the, the time, but what you're sending to. So, right. you know, we found that, you know, say we're promoting this webinar to our, to our database, um, any time during the week gives us a pretty good return, sometime after lunch, say lunch. Right. But if we want to promote, if we have a new case study that we want to share, mm -hmm. more people are interested over the weekend. You right. know, we've sent out on a Saturday and got tremendous results. And even with uh, split testing, we found mm -hmm. that Saturday was really great because it's right. there. There are no, people are in the mode to look at those. It's a, right. it's a longer form of content, so mm -hmm. it, it's you know definitely worth testing all the options. And, and I think this is a. I think that it, this is a great opportunity to learn more about your customers too. Certainly that the answer lies mainly with email marketing, but it could really uh, shed some light on shopping preferences and behaviors as well. Um, something that comes immediate to mind is like uh, the new uh, ad camp, well, not so new, but uh, uh, the, the recent push that Taco Bell has been doing in terms of promoting the fourth meal. I don't think that's a mistake. I'm sure that that's come from a market research where they found that a significant number of um, their target customers are purchasing from midnight onward, and in which case was the primary driver towards you know, promoting uh, this particular campaign. And in a likewise fashion, if uh, you may not be at, uh, to the scale of Taco Bell, but if you're really uh, finding through your research and uh, through just the testing that most of your customers are open, opening the emails at midnight, for example, why not implement a midnight madness campaign, something like that, that really strikes to the heart of their behavior and really ratchets, ratchets up the, the not only the urgency, but the relevancy of your campaign as well. You know, when you were talking earlier about, um, you know, we're talking about what the best time to send is now, we're talking about consistency. Uh, one of the things that occurred to me is that, and we're talking about making part of a holistic marketing plan, mm -hmm. is it's not all that difficult to look at your store and see when people are buying. Absolutely. And, you know, look at what the traffic, uh, look what the traffic looks like at different times during the day. And maybe do an email blast an hour before, a half an hour before what your hottest periods are. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it might, you might find that you're shaking more customers out of the tree. Oh, that's right? brilliant. Absolutely. I'm going to write that down. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Ah, rent or buy a list. One of my ah. favorite questions. So, um, yeah, Michael, uh, we also hear a lot about renting or buying lists. And uh, for you listeners out there, um, please chime in. I mean, is this, I'm sure that vendors are knocking down your door saying we can give you 100,000 quote unquote qualified leads for $10,000. And Michael, as uh, you know, as, as the head honcho of marketing here, I'm sure you get um, solicited for list rentals all the time for our Daily. email program. Daily. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's tempting, right? It is tempting. I mean, you know, the, the email comes in, they says, hey, they say, hey, you know, we've got all these really qualified people. And, you know, for $10,000, you can rent this list for six months. Um, right. My big question is, is my name on that list? And how did it get on that list? How did, right. I, get, how did I get on your list? Exactly, exactly. And um, so I think therein lies the answer, Michael. Um, the short answer to this question is no. Um, and the reason for that is that you cause confusion with the end recipient. And not only that, you're going to get, uh, chances are you're going to get hammered with spam complaints and you really rapidly erode your goodwill, um, towards this particular, um, toward, towards this particular segment of the marketplace. And not only that, I think that the most, um, the most damaging aspect of list rental or purchase is the idea of relevancy. So you're investing $10,000 in a list. Um, first and foremost, there's no guarantee that these are actually qualified leads for your particular product mm -hmm. or service. But secondarily, um, adding a layer of complexity to that is there's, there's no guarantee, especially with products in a very involved purchase cycle, 
um, long tail products, so to speak, there's no guarantee that you're hitting the mess. The messaging is hitting a pain point at that particular point in time of the recipient. Right. I mean, we, you know, anecdotally, you know, besides my own, um, my own experience with list buying, we've got a couple of people that chimed in right away saying that, you know, the ticket price is really high for lists and you get no sales. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, here, a, a quote from somebody that's on the webinar. Yeah, I got lots of offers to buy lists. I did buy a mail list and not a soul bought a thing. Yeah. Um, and that's that's not uncommon because, you know, I mean, like you said, they're not qualified. The message isn't relevant. And, right. and chances are, if they're on a list that's being sold, they're getting hit by a lot of people. So yep. their spam filters cranked up and right. they're blocking a lot. So. So, so, Michael, if I may just add one more final thought before we move on, is that there is one exception to this rule. And it's not a strict list rental or purchase. And the idea is to be able to co-brand as part of a, an event sponsorship, for example. And uh, Michael, I know you've been to IRCE and other, yes. uh, other events like that. And I'm sure you've been sold packages where you buy, for example, the belly band of the program and, and you get an email blast that's included with that. What are you saying about my belly, Tim? <laughs> um, so... This is a key exception where I think that um, the exception lies in the idea that it's highly relevant. But I also venture to say that you need to keep it within the context of what that co-branded sponsorship entails. Right, right. Um, yeah, I mean, and that's something we do too. We do partner mailings, but it's, you know, the when one of our partners shares a list with us, mm -hmm. they pre-qualify them because they don't want to damage their brand by right. us sending them a, a on e spamming their, their list. Right. Plus, uh, you know, we include their branding so they right. know that this is why and very, and right. The, and they all say, you know, you're signing up to receive email from us and qualified partners. Right. And, and honestly, we only do it if we think it's something that's relevant to their customers. Yes. I mean, we don't just take their list and start spamming with all kinds of things. Right. You know, it's only you know, hyper relevant stuff because we don't want to damage our relationship with that. To your point. Yeah, absolutely. Relevance. So um, if you are, for example, a sponsor at IRCE this year, thank you. You know, you, it's, it's a great event. And if you have an opportunity, for example, to uh, send out an email, um, keep it simple. Uh, don't go in the nitty gritty and details of your product. Um, leave that to your booth staff. Uh, keep your message simple. Visit us at booth 514 where you'll enter a drawing for an iPad, for example, and we'll see you there, period. And uh, have your booth staff and your sales staff on site take care of the rest. Right. Okay, so can I design a program emails myself? Well, a few people have popped in saying that they're already working with an email service provider. Uh, a few have said, wow, it's overwhelming to try to have to turn around an email in a week. We understand, you know, yeah. believe me, we understand. Uh, not only do we service, you know, hundreds of clients, um, but we also do our stuff internally as well through, through the same system. So, yeah, it can be a, it can be a time challenge, that's for sure. Oops. Absolutely. And I think that, Michael, you spoke to some of the complexity of managing email. I mean, it's not just the logistics of managing a calendar and determining when an ideal time to send is, for example. Um, but then there's a complexity of design. Yeah. Uh, what's too long? You know, well, yeah, kind of email is too long. Well, you know, not, not only the, you know, how long should it be and, you know, what color should I use? One of the, the questions that popped up is, is the, the question we hear very often, HTML versus text. Right. Well, that's, you know, email marketing is an entire segment of marketing and there's a lot to learn. Right. So, you know, can you design an email and program it yourself? If you're working with an email service provider, absolutely. They provide all kinds of templates. Um, you know, very often the suggestion is to use the the design agency, a creative agency that you right. use for your website or for your print ads because right. they can do it. Um, but the expertise is really lacking. I mean, yeah. the, the only reason I send emails rather than having Tim's team do it is because Tim's team originally did do it and I just learned from them. And it took a long time. <laughs> It took a long time to get it right, and, and mistakes still happen, you know, and so I rely on these guys because they are they are experts. So, you know, I would encourage everybody to, you know, seek out a, somebody who specializes in, in email marketing because, you know, the different things that you run across, which we've got some questions about, how do I avoid spam filters? 
uh, you know, how do I how do I program the HTML? The the experts will be able to do that. You know, right. very often the email service providers can protect you from spam, but you know what you'll get when you see uh, a, a spam alert when you're getting ready to send your email, it'll pop up and say, oh, this contains spam. It may not even tell you what part of it is spam. So right. an expert would be able to respond to that very right. quickly and say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I put, right. I put free in all caps, bold. And in Louis subject, Vuitton in the subject line. Right. And Louis Vuitton is not in the content of right. the email. So um, the experts can spot that stuff and they can take care of it very, very quickly. Absolutely. And Michael, I, I mean, what you just said is spot on. I mean, it reminds me of um, transportation. I mean, I view designing and programming your emails as riding a bike from point A to point B. Can it be done? Of course. Um, can it be done more efficiently and perhaps more cost effectively given time is money? Absolutely. Um, and to your point, I mean, you have large scale agencies like, um, you know, uh, like a lot of these firms that service Ford and um, Kia and, yeah. and, brand, and Mercedes, certainly. And they're more like uh, purchasing a purchasing a larger, larger firm for that. You know, it's, it's, it's almost like purchasing, you know, a, a McLaren or a, a Bentley. Right. Um, but then there are also a, a wide swath of um, kind of uh, agencies and firms. And Michael, I mean, you've worked in agency side and brand management extensively. Um, do you have any tips for our re listeners out there who may have a, a, a budget, but it's let's just say less than uh, less than five hundred dollars a month to expend on email? Um, any any one or two handy tips that you might have um, to impart on our listeners today? Sure. I mean, you know. The first thing is if you're if you've got a monthly budget of you know say five hundred dollars or even a thousand dollars a month you're going to spend on email marketing, chances are those first of all the large agencies servicing uh, Ford and Kia aren't, aren't going to touch you. I mean they don't even talk to any customers that are going to spend less than a million dollars with them. But even when you get down to the small and medium sized firms, that's such small money for the amount of work it is because they don't have an email specialist on staff. Not to say that none of them do, but agencies just are not structured that way. They have print designers and web designers, and that's is is niche as they really get because they have to service a, a lot of different kinds of clients in a lot of different ways. So unless they have an email service ex, uh, email service expert on staff, it's you're really just rolling the dice. I mean, you might as well do it yourself at that point. Yeah. Sure, they, you know, some of the skills you have to have, like programming, HTML, um, being able to use Photoshop, you know, knowing the knowing the, the basics of design, like color, contrast, composition, uh, knowing what, what colors convert, what colors mean, things like that, where to put buttons, um, how to write. I mean, there's a lot of skills involved. And, <clears throat> you know, if you have to do it yourself, you know, good luck. There's some free design programs. And I'm sure you'll, you know, just doing email marketing will get you results. <clears throat> but when you're ready to, you know, really leverage it for your business, um, you really need to seek out an expert. So let's see. Okay, let's, so let's talk about best practices. There's, there's a couple questions that uh, a couple of people ask some a very basic sort of 30,000 foot view questions. What are the best what are the most important things to remember for successful email marketing? And what are the, some of the things I should avoid uh, so I don't turn off my um, recipients of my email? Sure, absolutely. So first and foremost, uh, in terms of best practice, this is a best practice for any kind of marketing endeavor that you may, uh, may uh, manage. And that really is the simple fact of getting organized. Um, the idea is really thinking about why you're doing email marketing in the first place. And what kind of initial expectations that you have for a baseline, um, especially for individuals who are starting out with email, um, it may not necessarily be all that realistic to go from $100 in revenue per campaign, for example, to $100,000 in revenue per campaign. But rather, it's going to be getting organized so you can make those incremental changes um, from month to month and from campaign to campaign. Um, and another aspect of getting organized is really getting your organization in line with your email mm -hmm. marketing. Um, don't put email marketing in a corner. Um, and what I mean by that is that it is so easy to be able to keep email marketing as this, in a way, cloak and dagger effort where you have one marketing manager or one marketing assistant developing the emails, developing 
uh, featuring, you know, deciding which products to feature, even what discounts to offer. Um, make sure that you have the organizational buy-in of your of your company and of, certainly of your management, so that uh, email itself is becomes to be viewed as an investment rather than just a, a quick solve tool. Right. Calls to action. This is critical, um, and this speaks to design excellence as well as ergonomics and making sure that you're delivering what your customers are asking of you. And You'd be surprised, Michael, again, how many emails I get where I simply have the subject line is clear, but when I open it, I have absolutely no idea where to find information about a product. Um, and it could be because I'm looking, staring at a wall of text and it looks like I'm just reading a phone book, but on a screen, <laughs> or it could be because the call to action, the product picture is very nice. The product description is very nice, but I have no idea where to click to find out more about the product I want to buy. Right. You know, and when you mentioned writing to the third grade level, I mean, it's that's actually kind of an important um, design uh, theory as well. I mean, there's a reason when you uh, approach a door in, in a public space, whether it's an office building or a restaurant, something like that, it says open above the handle. Right. Now, most people know that it's a door and you should open it, but there are those people who walk right into it uh, there was a, I remember a viral video of a, I think it was a pizza hut where they, the staff, which was, you know, a bunch of teenagers was trying to clean the windows so well that people would walk right into them <laughs> because, because their doors didn't say open and their doors right. didn't have a bar across the middle. Cool. So, you know, it's important not only from a, a, a content writing standpoint, but also right. a design standpoint to not make your, your customers have to search and figure out what they have to do. Well, I mean, that's really important. If you view, I think I love that illustration, Michael, about the door because the email is a door to your website and it, it begs the question, are you leveraging email and is there a clear push, pull or automatic? Right in it and what do, what is your customer expecting right um for this is really critical for product features because are you leading pro, are you leading the reader to the specific product a category or the general landing page and how is that going to impact your customers patience and their willingness to buy right i mean you know i've been i've been doing web design since the um the mid 90s and i remember when the flashing button that said click here was all the rage right of course that's when when graphics first started became becoming part of web design initially it was just a lot of text and if you had a background it was awesome <laughs> and everybody had the same little animated torch right. but it, it, it doesn't matter what industry you're you're in if you're uh you know selling selling cars online or you're you're trying to share information or you're a nonprofit, anything like that and, you know, somebody mentioned that we seem to be, be very focused on e-commerce, which is what Exclusive Concepts does focus on. But this goes for anybody. I mean, you want to make it very, very easy for people to perform the action that you want them to. It's all about conversion. You know, we have a service here called conversion testing that we do for people's websites. And the conversion doesn't have to be a sale. It just has to be that action. And what we test for is, you know, what's effective in creating the conversion, getting somebody to share their email address, getting somebody to download a white paper, getting somebody to buy your product, uh, you know, hiding it, obfuscating it in any way um, is just is, is going to kill the conversion. Well, it's not a matter of you just hiding it, Michael. I mean, if the fact of the matter is, is that it needs to be as clear as day. It right. can't, it can't be, if it's, if, if you're using a learn more, then that's a great click through, but it, um, but you should also be able to provide the content on the other end for somebody to actually learn more. Right, right. So you're not going to say learn more when you want them to buy something. You want to say buy now it, because after all, you want them to buy now. Exactly. Unless, you know, if you want them to, I think our button for this webinar that said register today or register now, something like that. So, you know, let them know what action you're expecting the user to perform uh, right in the email. So when they get to the page, they know what's going right. on. Right. And I think that one more final thing before we move on, Michael, is that, um, yes, this is a gross generalization, but you really, especially if you're a large, if, if you have a large swath in the marketplace. Uh, so, for example, if you're selling auto parts where you don't necessarily have a key age demographic, I think it's critical to be able to uh, design and to have calls to action that are clear, even for uh 
technological novices and right. um that could be either on the outliers of too young people kids who are 18 but more than likely people who are in the baby baby boomer uh, generation where they may not be as acclimated to technology or um or um, digital communications and to be able absolutely. to kind of design accordingly mm -hmm. absolutely testing for deliverability is yes. huge um i mean if there's a dead horse today we have beat that that would be deliverability um and again, a lot of email service providers out there have some semblance of spam deliverability testing. Now, that's a great place to start, but by no means is that the comprehensive end-all be-all for testing for deliverability. There are a lot of uh, methods out there, and we, we at Exclusive Concepts have a proprietary set of algorithms and uh, processes to be able to ensure that emails go into the inboxes of major uh, platforms such as Gmail, Outlook, and um, Yahoo Mail. Um, so really, the, the key to this is that to view your email campaigns as an investment. You invest the time, resources, and effort into creating this email. Um, now, the final step, that final 50 feet of that race, is to be able to make sure that that email that you spent so much time on actually gets delivered into the inbox and um, maximizes the potential that um, that somebody is going to uh, read it. Right, right. Okay, now uh, this is the Q&A, so if, if people have uh, more questions they'd like to ask, and I'd like to go, just go through some of the uh, the questions we already have. Let me uh, just scroll back to the top because we got a lot of questions, which is good. A few of them would say, has the presentation started yet because we're stuck on that slide. Um, so I have a question that I'm interested in in the audience, actually. Uh, for you listeners sure. who are left there, um, I'm actually very curious as far as if your mar primary market is uh, B2C or B2B. And maybe we can skew, because there are little nuances in terms of answers to these questions uh, based on um, whether the primary thrust of your business is uh, business to consumer or business to business. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, I mean... You know, please throw out, you know, your responses to those questions and, you know, we'll address some of them. You know, I want to go back to, you know, the beginning uh, A question we hear quite often is, you know, we don't have a large email list. How do we get more emails, uh, emails for potential customers? You know, this is something as a marketing director I deal with all the time. It's leads, right? You know, the certain percentage of your leads are marketing qualified and, and a certain percentage of them actually convert. And, you know, this is more of a marketing question than an email question, but you know, I think one of the email aspects is make your email shareable and incentivize people to share them. So, you know, with either offers, deals, or just, hey, share this to Facebook. You know, that's a great way to get your brand in front of other people. Yeah. And I want to caution people out there. It, although it's about numbers, it's not always about numbers. Um, 10 qualified leads, uh, Michael, I'm sure you'll agree, is much better than 100 unqualified leads. Exactly. Um, so the name of the game is not isn't just to get numbers up, but it's to get numbers of people who are actively engaged and ready to buy from right. campaign to campaign. Absolutely, Qual qualified customers, and that's that's really the key. You know, that's that's a key for PPC, SEO, um, you know, email marketing. It's you know, you just don't want people. You want you want people who are interested in what you have, whether you're selling something or you're looking to share thought leadership. Um, so, so, I mean, beyond looking at forwards, there are a lot of technologies out there um, that will help you grow your list. I think uh, one of the most obvious is to be able to install a sign up on your website. Um, and most email service providers have all the code for your developer to be able to implement a simple sign up. Um, and one thing that I have noticed about a lot of um, email marketers and their websites is that their their incentive to sign up for an email newsletter is poor at best. Um, I see often all the time, uh, oftentimes sign up for our email newsletter or get our email newsletter, sign up for email, stay in touch. These kinds of messages themselves have no incentive for the reader unless they're and unless they're very heavily invested in your brand. Mm -hmm. um, think about the messaging that you want to put on the sign up before you implement it. Um, messages such as uh, great deals, sneak products, sneak previews, things like that. That's what gets the attention of readers out there. Um, and I think that that's an interesting phenomenon where I think a lot of brands out there just automatically assume that 
um, the brand manager, excuse me, out there automatically assumes that their brand is so interesting that any people are fighting to get their email can to get their email newsletters, which is uh, oftentimes not the case. Right, and and that goes for you know for all kinds of email marketers. If you're not offering something of value, why? I mean, someone's contact information is very valuable to them, so why should they share it unless you've got something right. to offer them? And which which actually brings us back a little bit to web design and and worrying about conversions for web design. You know, we have forms all over our site and they are, you know, geared towards qualified people who are interested in a particular service. And I think that's a good practice for anybody. You know, you know, if you've got something to download, say it's a white paper or a, a news article or an ebook or anything like that, if you're not if you're not in the customer store, you know, offering those things up in exchange for email addresses is a great way to, Absolutely. you know, to get people to sign in. But at the same time, you want qualified leads. And one difficulty of offering these great incentives is that you get these one-time email uh, e email addresses from people who are interested in getting that white paper or getting that coupon. Right. So I think that that also speaks to having a little bit of um, some smarts as far as what you're offering and whether or not that's going to lead to qualified leads coming in the door or just anybody who wants your 10% coupon. Right, exactly. Um, you know, we've talked a little bit about increasing open rates. Some of the thing, the most important thing we covered was the most important two things were the testing to make sure it's going to go through and not somebody spam and exciting headlines. And we've talked a little bit about right. that. And in terms of open rates too, um, think about the content. Uh, if, if especially if you're offering a lot of products or a complex product, keep it simple. Um, don't offer 16 different products with a paragraph detail each. Um, offer 12 and have a have a have a menu for the rest of the categories. Things of that nature are going to help you improve not only the open rate but responsiveness as well. Right. And, and those of you who are not selling directly through email. If you're sharing a blog post or a news article, don't put the whole thing in the email. Give right. them a little something to come back to your mm -hmm. website. Then you know they'll open it, they'll click through it. You'll be able to uh, make some better judgments based on that. It's not just that, but then you can all, all of a sudden open an entirely new realm of using email as a traffic generator mm -hmm. um, to your website, as opposed to just strictly as a conversion machine. Exactly, and and you know to that point, once you're bringing them to the website, there's further opportunities for conversion there. If you want them to um, sign up or download or show more interest in what you're doing, that's important. Um, you know, kind of a little bit near that subject, uh, somebody asked about creating post dated emails for the next year. So they um, so every six weeks for the next year, they they push them out. I mean, sh I'm sure you can talk about it from an email strategy standpoint. I can certainly talk about it from a marketing content standpoint. So, I mean, what are, you, what are your thoughts about send, setting? I, I, I think it makes sense to pre-plan, uh, but pre-planning for the entire year in February may, may, prov may uh, produce some redundancies. Um, so the only thing, the thing that I can think of that makes sense for pre-planning to that extent is, um, cars or technologies and products and services that do not change radically from quarter to quarter over the course of 2013. Um, the 2013 Mercedes is going to be the same whether you buy it today or you buy it in August. But there is something to be said about how quickly customers' preferences, behaviors, and priorities change. And you're also going to realize very quickly that your competitors and their approach to marketing and their messaging is also going to change. So I, I would caution against planning that far in advance, sure. although planning for the month or the quarter may be a prudent decision based on your line of business. Right, right. And, and I think the person who asked is, is not, uh, not involved in e-commerce. It's more brand building thought leadership stuff. Sure. And you know, that goes back to, um, more to digital strategy, you know, time, timely content is very, very important. Um, you know, a term we, we refer to in social media as news jacking is very helpful for giving you content for your email. Right. Um, and that's not something that can be really planned. Um, the, uh, 
you know, a, an event happens, it gives you an opportunity to write an email. You know, we, we have, we deal with that here. You know, Google doesn't, uh, despite what some of our customers may think, Google doesn't call us up or email us and say, hey, we're changing our search algorithm. We find out along with everybody else. Right. Uh, when they do it on a Friday and Monday, we get frantic emails from our customers and we, you know, we track it down to the Google blog and they say, oh yeah, for all you people that are freaking out over the weekend, we did make a change. Right. Um, to be able to respond to that in a really timely fashion and keep your content right. fresh is very important. Right. So, so building out, I think building out a calendar for, for the year is yes. important and, and we, in the marketing department here does that, mm -hmm. but we also leave room in each quarter because we know we'll do more timely stuff. There's always things that pop up mm -hmm. and if you want to stay relevant and, and, and stay a thought leader for your industry, being on top of those changes and being able to respond to them uh, quickly is, is, is pretty important. Absolutely. And uh, as you said, Michael, there's no harm in planning a, a holistic strategy a year in advance and developing a set of goals that you like email marketing to accomplish. And there's certainly nothing wrong with planning out a calendar. But when it comes down to um, flexibility and the ability to navigate around market conditions that change from day to day, um, you may want to defer planning everything out for the rest of this year at this point in time. Right. So uh, a question we typically get, we didn't really respond to earlier, HTML full of pictures or plain text? Ah, that's a great question. Um, if you have the capability, I would encourage every one of you listeners out there to use and fully embrace HTML. And the reason behind that is that um, for the most part, a picture is worth a thousand words in email marketing. And secondarily, a text-based email is going to give you, it first and foremost, is not going to have a clear call to action. It's because more than likely, even if you have um, a link, it's going to be buried in paragraphs of text. But secondarily, unless your website looks exactly like that and it's just all text, you're offering an inconsistent experience from the time you pass um, from the email to the website. I mean, I think a good a good rule of thumb when you're designing your email and you're thinking the text versus HTML email is, you know, sit back from your screen and squint. Do you still know where to click? Is yes. it still obvious? And that's something you just, it's very difficult to achieve with just text. Well, I mean, if, if it's, it's certainly also possible, but not. Also, if you're using text, and I'm assuming you're talking about just straight plain text, there is no clicking. Right, right. Um, so a few people ask, how do, um, how to avoid going into spam filters. I mean, that's that really comes down to the the, the ASPs for the most part because they, they deal with there's it. There's some uh, there's some some aspects of that, um, but also there is secret sauce. I mean, I'm not going to lie. E exclusive concepts through time, and I was part of that team. Uh, we developed some algorithms that um, we run every campaign through to be able to ascertain whether or not this message is going into the spam. And our algorithms are frighteningly accurate, um, but I can share with you a couple tips um, aside from just building your own algorithm through this. Uh, first and foremost, as Michael, when you pointed out earlier today, avoid certain brand names um, like Louis Vuitton, for example. Luxury goods um, typically trigger spam camp complaint, uh, spam spam filters. Um, but secondary, look at your content um, within your content, especially if you have text-based emails. If you have things, uh, words like coupon, sale. Um, and it may be some very benign words like enlargement, for example, um, all things, you know, all kidding aside, uh, these kinds of, uh, words and content trigger spam filters, um, without really minimal effort. And if you want, if you want to see some, some great examples of what triggers, uh, spam filters, look through your spam folder yes, sometime. You'd be absolutely. shocked at some of the stuff that you're not Absolutely. Seeing. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, so somebody asked, when you're doing um, split testing, they said subject line or content also. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they have a very short timeline to turn around email. So mm -hmm. I, I guess the question is, you know, do we really have to do split testing on the email design? No, um, not at all. What I advocate, and uh, this is a position that we're adopting here, is um, rather than saying split testing, we say incremental testing. And this isn't because of laziness. It's not because of lack of effectiveness or whatnot. Incremental testing is great because it allows us to gather multiple data points to on a particular factor. So what I mean by incremental testing is instead of splitting your list, 
keep your list intact at 100% and send out an email in, um, with a factor in mind. So for example, it could be the size of your shop now buttons. Uh, let's say the size right now is at um, 25 pixels wide, it's tiny. So let's see how people respond to that. Um, the next campaign, enlarge your uh, shop now buttons to 125 pixels and see how people respond to that. So in, in essence, you're testing, but at the same time, you're deploying at the same time and you're gathering very valid um, touch points from campaign to campaign. Right, right. And so, you know, over, over time, you're becoming more, effect, more efficient, more effective with your email. So you have to do less of that. So those, you know, worried about time, um, you know, the testing will, the testing you do now will pay off in the future and make your job easier. Absolutely. Um, let's see, what are some of the other uh, very specific questions? Uh, there's a few people who I sent my email to that had very pointy questions that, that aren't really relevant to email marketing. So I've, I sent them my email to get in touch with me. Um, okay, what are some of the most important things not to do so you don't turn off clients? That's a great question, Michael. Um, first and foremost, I think it's the soft touch. So when you're sending a coupon out, there, I've found that many end customers, not only do they expect coupons nowadays simply because of the nature of the marketplace, but they expect the coupon to be as simple as humanly possible. So if you're offering a discount, make clear that if you're excluding any brands or product categories, there's nothing more frustrating than getting a coupon code, being excited, putting an item in the cart. So at the point you're ready to buy, putting in the coupon code and not having it work. Um, yeah, so that aspect is critically important. Make your offers clear and as simple as possible. Um, another thing to, another aspect to avoid is um, avoid linking to external sites that are not your website. Um, keep it in keep it in your in the family, so to speak, because at the end of the day, even though you're tracking responses through cookies, um, you're going to want to have a straight line from point A, which is your web, your email, to point B, which is at the end of the day, the shopping cart. So don't make things complicated by linking to partner sites, um, linking to external third party um, YouTube sites, things like that. Um, if you want to have YouTube uh, videos and things like that, post that on your blog so that at least it's pointing to a website or a landing page that's affiliated with your brand. Sure. Um... Somebody had a quick question I think I can answer pretty quickly. They said, we have established a consistent Monday email. Would it be wise to suddenly change it up on people who may not be expecting it? Um, if you're getting good results, no. Uh, that's the short answer. But uh, another part of that answer is that you have an opportunity to do testing on new people coming into your database that, that aren't uh, expecting that email. So you know, take advantage of that. You may see your results are improving. Um, let's see, what are some of the, you get a couple people asking B2B and B2C. Okay. Um, for those of you asking B2C and B2B, um, be more specific in the question you're asking, cause I'm not sure. Okay, what, uh... sure. Absolutely. So, um, there is a, a, thank you for sharing by the way. Um, so there are some nuances in terms of B2B that differentiate email marketing from B2C. Um, so B2B, I have found to be uh, much more emphasized, uh, the campaigns that we develop for our B2B clients emphasize content much more. Um, and it's usually straight to the point. It's about product specs and not about touchy feelies. It's about this widget being three eighths of an inch uh, uh, wide, two eighths of an inch um, uh, high, uh, top, tall or high, and it's $4.99 each. Um, and it's great for aircraft, uh, Lear jets, and uh, general aircraft. Those are the kinds of uh, pieces of information that are critical for email. It's straight to the point, and it helps within. Uh, it helps provide an informed buying decision for a buying manager, for example. Um, whereas with B two C, you want to make it a little more touchy feely. Uh, perhaps the widget is uh, is three eighths, still three eighths wide and two eighths um, high. But it, it was made in Italy by the finest Italian craftsmen, and it's it's made with um, iron that was wrought from Vesuvius, for example. <laughs> um, and in which case, you're giving a much more soft touch. It's still four ninety nine, same price, um, but you're 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 inspiring them to buy in a very different way. So somebody asked, they have no problem with um, the size of the list, but their their difficulty is 
incentivizing the readers to perform a specific action or mm -hmm. to convert, which is, you know, when we talked about the fact that the numbers are important, but the numbers aren't, are not important. Uh, that's exactly what we're talking about because the key is not to send out a lot of email or get a lot of people to open your email unless you're just sharing reading material. Uh, the, the trick is even if you're just sharing reading material that you really want people to click because you have no other way to, to figure out if they're engaged, you right. can look at op your open rate and you can, which means your subject line worked and didn't fall into the spam filter. And that's about all it tells you. Right. Um, but after that, the click through rate really tells you what is important to them. What content are you sharing that's important to them? Right. And uh, absolutely. And I think that this is where email becomes a cog in the, a unique cog in the machine. And when we're referring to uh, not getting a response, for example, um, it really depends on what kind of response. If it's talking about ultimately the conversion or click through, um, a conversion rate especially, um, that is a much larger picture because you're not only looking at the email experience, but the website experience as mm -hmm. well. Right. Um, could be a great email, could be nothing wrong with your email, but if the website's poorly designed, if it doesn't inspire confidence for me to put my credit card number into it, then there's a problem that, right. that's well beyond email. Uh, and, you know, let's let's look at a you know a thirty thousand foot view of attracting attracting conversions. Um, in your email blast, are you offering anything of value? You know, you may have an, a great list, but is it a qualified list? You right. know, are these people who should be interested in what you're selling? Um, have they already bought what you're selling? Right. You know, are you selling it at a price point they want, or are you offering something of value that fits their budget? Right. Um, is it is it timely you know i mean are you are you trying to pitch life insurance to 18 year olds right probably exactly. not the best time yeah. could they buy life insurance sure they could buy life insurance are they thinking about it you know they're probably not thinking about it until they're married and they have their first kid and then right. say oh my god i need life insurance so it's just a perfect time to hit them if you know when that is so right. um you know your your offer your offers the most important thing to after getting people to, to open your email or uh, see your ad or whatever marketing activity you're performing, the offer is the next most important thing. Um, you've got to make sure that it's, you know, it's, it's valuable and it's timely and that it's relevant. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, what are some of the other questions we have? Well, I think that actually, okay, uh, somebody came in late. They asked if the webinar uh, will be archived. I responded to them, but in case... There's other people that joined late that didn't ask. I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you guys about our new small business email package, and I'm gonna give you a link to download this webinar. The webinar won't be available immediately. We have to wait for the go to webinar service to process it, download it, edit it, put it up. So you will be able to get the deck right away, and you will be able to get to our brochure right away at the URL I'm going to give you. But it may take a, a day or two for the this recording to go up. And uh, you will be receiving an email follow-up with a link to that. So we have been serving um, serving small businesses and medium-sized businesses with an email package for uh, many, many years now. And we have recently launched a new small business email package and that's specifically geared towards <clears throat> very, you know, much, much smaller businesses. And, you know, Tim, tell us. You know, let me preface this by saying you won't find this on our website yet. We don't have a brochure. We don't have any case studies yet. This is a brand new service. This is our uh, first unveiling of this, actually, Michael, in terms of uh, really talking to this at the market at large. So this is a very special moment. Um, our uh, strategic small business email package is designed for uh, small businesses, uh, solo entrepreneurships, and individuals who um, don't have the time and perhaps not even the resources to deploy email campaigns. And the emails um, themselves are optimized uh, des um, in terms of design, strategy, execution, and testing. Um, it's uh, $3.95 per development of the campaign, and we take care of everything from A to Z, planning, design, as well as implementation. Um, and uh, this service came about because we spoke to a lot of um, starter, you know, kind of beginner email, beginner email marketers who don't necessarily need the Mercedes. They don't need 
um, every bell and whistle, but they want to just get to dip their toe in the pool, get started with email with something more basic, something that they can grasp, they can grasp and integrate and graft into their business. Um, so this is how we came up with a small business email package. Great, great. In the, uh, and it includes design, strategy, execution, testing, a lot yep. of the things people ask for. Right. Um, that's, you know, that's great. And the, there's a couple different uh, levels of, of the service, um, but the smallest one starts at three ninety five, dollars not including the setup fee, which is a, isn't a whole lot of money. So, right. you know, for, for under 400 bucks, you can get somebody else to right. deal with, answer all the questions that you've been asking right. to deal with. And, and, and this is really designed to be able to bring, bring best of class email marketing to uh, smaller business owners um, who just, as you said, just want it off their plate at a cost effective price. Sure. So enough of the sales pitch. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for coming. Uh, those who asked for um, a recording of this webinar or access to the deck, you want to take a screenshot of this or write it down. I'll leave it up for a couple minutes while I'm talking here. It's exclusiveconcepts.com slash mind-blowing email. That'll take you to a landing page <clears throat> where you can uh, download the deck or you can view the deck right there. I guess if you <clears throat> if you click through the slide share, you'll be able to download it. I've, I've left it uh, public for you to get. Um, the landing page also has... Um, has a brochure for our existing email package, but as I said, not the small business one. You can learn more about our email marketing services and the other services we offer. Um, we did record this presentation. Uh, I have to review it to make sure it's working, and it usually takes a, a, a day or two for the GoToWebinar service to process it for me to review it and edit out anything, um, any issues we have with it. So that'll be up shortly, and everybody that registered will be receiving an email when it goes live so if i can get it up we can get it up by tomorrow you'll get an email tomorrow if not friday or early next week where you can um you can watch this the whole video so if there are no other questions uh we will say goodbye we've left let's see back a page so i'm going to post my email in the chat section so you'll all see it if anybody's got any other questions that we didn't answer I will be happy to help you out. Let's make sure I spelled it right. So it's concepts.com. So this is my, my direct email. So if you have any uh, additional questions, like I said, feel free to ask. Uh, if you have questions about the, uh, the video webinar, the download, and things like that, I'll be uh, happy to respond to them. I'm going to bow out now, and I'm going to leave this page up for just a couple more uh, seconds for you to write everything down. And we thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Tim.